Everything that we've been doing so far has all been about linear motion, going backwards and forwards, accelerating backwards and forwards, and now we're going to actually start getting into things that rotate or repeat themselves in a periodic uh, manner. To start out with, we're going to do centripetal force. Centripetal means center pointing. So this is any force that points to the center of a circle. And whenever you have a velocity that is moving tangential and a force that is pointing along a radius of a circle, it's going to cause that object to move in a circle. That, that circle might be a little uh, flattened out three-dimensional there. Now to explain how this idea of a force pointing to the center of a circle or along the radius and a tangential velocity, aka going straight if you want to simplify it down, creates centripetal force or centripetal motion objects going in a circle, I want to come back to horizontal projectile motion here. Imagine you're standing up on top of a cliff, on top of a whatever it is, and you throw something horizontally. Well the motion, because gravity is pulling straight down, force gravity down, the motion that you're going to have is this arcing motion here. Now I want you to imagine something completely unrealistic. Imagine you were on top of a tower that was insanely high, in fact so high you were way up in the atmosphere. And imagine that you could throw the ball much, much faster than you actually could. If you were up high enough, the tower kept going up, and you were able to throw it fast enough, right? You, you, your motion would end up, the curve might actually end up missing the surface of the earth, uh, going around the earth on the other side. Now I think we can all agree that that's a pretty silly idea there of being on top of that uh, on top of that high of a tower and throwing a ball that fast but it's not that silly of, of an idea whenever we're talking about or orbital motion or something above the earth like a satellite a satellite's high enough and moving fast enough this could actually work because a satellite gravity is pointing straight down and it has a very high speed Newton's first law says an object in motion wants to remain in motion in a straight line at a constant velocity so note it's wanting to go straight away from the earth Earth, but gravity is going to pull it down and just like with a horizontal launch that's going to cause this object to curve but it's moving fast enough that whenever it gets over here it has missed the earth's surface now gravity still pointing in towards the earth because gravity always points in and it's caused a change in direction in the velocity but the velocity once again is trying to go straight and so now we have once again horizontal projectile motion right but it's going fast enough that it will miss the earth's surface around on the other side now, once again gravity coming in, velocity going out tangential, right, to, and, and by the way tangential means, and I should say this, at a right angle to uh, the radius, also uh, a line tangential only touches the curve for us here, a circle, at one point, so notice only one point there as, as opposed to, you know, standard lines one, two points, um, so only at one point. And by now you probably already catch the drift of what's going to happen here. And this idea of orbital motion here is actually how all centripetal force works. There's a force pointing into a circle with a velocity moving off tangential to it. Or if you want to think about it straight, that's another way that's kind of a layman's term maybe of thinking about it. And because of that force pulling inwards along the radius, it causes the velocity vector to change directions. And as long as the velocity vector is fast enough, uh, and, and this force is pulling straight in, we're going to end up getting centripetal motion. Now obviously if the velocity wasn't very fast, it's going to curve down, right, into the circle here. But as long as these two work out, we're going to have centripetal motion. How fast does the object actually have to be moving, you might ask? Well, that's governed by our centripetal force and centripetal acceleration equations. Here's the equation for centri centripetal acceleration. To have circular motion, the acceleration caused by the force pulling in is equal to the velocity squared divided by the radius. Then it follows, if you substitute your acceleration to F equals ma, sum of all the centripetal forces. We have to say sum of, because uh, there can be multiple forces pulling inwards and forces then pulling out of the circle. You'll see that in the future, but sum of the centripetal forces equals m v squared over r, where your v squared over r is the acceleration, so F equals ma. Two misconceptions I want to go ahead and dispel now also. Uh, whenever an object's going in a circular motion, if you cut the force, maybe the string is providing the centripetal force, it actually would be a good time to stop and say this. Centripetal force isn't a specific force. It's just a label that we apply to forces uh, that, that are causing things to go in a circular motion. So never think that centripetal force is this, is this thing out there. No, it's just a label. So in this case, I have a string. That's tension. That's providing my centripetal force. So tension would end up going in. 
tension for centripetal force in this case. Uh, you can actually see that here in that equation because tension is providing the centripetal force, so that went in there. But what happens if we cut the tension? So we cut the centripetal force. Where would the ball go? A common misconception is that it would spiral out like this, going around and around and around. Well, that's not the case. Newton's first law states that an object in motion remains in motion in a straight line. So instead, since the ball was already going tangential, it will continue to move tangential. If you cut the line, it will move tangential to the circle. Next myth I want to go ahead and deal with is a centri uh, centrifugal, uh, excuse me, centrifugal force. That's actually a made-up force. Where this comes from is think about a car. This is a common spot where some people might think of this. You're in the car here, and the car turns left, and your body from your perspective inside the car, thinks it feels a force to the right, which is not true, actually. What's actually happening is Newton's first law is being obeyed. Instead, there is a centripetal force. Specifically, it's being provided by the force of friction. More on that later in another video. But it's being, uh, there's a centripetal force pulling the car inwards to the circle. That's what makes the car go around the turn, changing the velocity vector that was going straight. And now the car is turning left and your body's following Newton's first law, wanting to go straight. So quite literally, the car's door runs into you, or the car's seat, the friction between your rear end and the seat, pulls you around, gives you the sensation that you're going right, but you're not. Your world, if you will, the car underneath you, is going left while you're trying to go straight. A few last things that I want to introduce, besides these two main equations that you need, is this idea of period, frequency, and angular frequency. Now, period and frequency, you've probably gotten in another course. Uh, period is the time it takes per revolution or per cycle, how long it takes you to make it all the way around. We use capital T for period, and it has a unit of seconds because it is a time. Please do not get the period, capital T, confused with tension, capital T. So be very careful in your problems with that. Frequency is the number of revolutions you ha that you are able to go in, uh, per second, and, and it can be a decimal number if you don't make it through an entire revolution. Also, these two are inverses of each other. One over the period equals the frequency, and one over the frequency equals the period. You should be able to kind of see that from their definitions. Last definition I need to give you is angular frequency. Now, angular frequency will become very important as we move forward. It's how many radians, or aka how much angle you clip off in one second, how many radians per second. Thus, Greek letter omega for it, unit of radians per second. And the equation for that is omega equals 2 pi times the frequency. Of course, knowing that frequency and uh, period are inverses, you could also say omega equals 2 pi over the period. Two more quick thoughts I want to point out before we work an example problem. First one is, if you need to know the velocity uh, to plug into the centripetal force or the centripetal acceleration equation, and you know how long it takes you to go around, and you know the radius, you can calculate it. Uh, think about that very simply. Velocity is displacement divided by time. And if you think about how far you end up going around a circle, well, that's the circumference. 2 pi r is the equation for circumference. And how long it takes you to go around one time is defined by the period, time it takes to do one revolution. So 2 pi r divided by the period will give you the velocity, circumference divided by the period. Uh, sometimes it's easy to give things, uh, depending on what the measurements were in a lab, uh, in terms of frequency instead of in period. Well, you can always get from frequency to period, or sometimes just depending on how how the measurements are going, it's easier to measure angle, how much angle is swept out per second, so you'll get angular frequency. Well, from angular frequency, you can get back to period and uh, over to your tangential velocity here. All right, this is a very straightforward centripetal force problem now, just to practice with. I have a ball, it's just rotating around on a string like this, so the force that's causing the centripetal force is tension, and there is no other forces pushing into the circle or pulling out, so this is going to be the only force I have to deal with in centripetal force. So the tension is pointing straight in, causing the velocity of the ball to change, causing it to go in a circle, centripetal motion. Now it makes a rotation every 0.5 seconds, and we're told the radius of this circle is 0.56 meters. And so with all this in mind, and the mass of the ball being given, uh, how much force must the string hold? Because if you end up spinning it too fast, the velocity increases, eventually the amount of force, the tension needed to cause this centripetal force uh, is going to be too great, and the string won't be able to provide it anymore. The string would end up snapping. 
So I start here with my centripetal force equation, but I do need to realize that what's actually causing the centripetal force is tension. So I'm going to put in a T there. Some of my centripetal forces is just tension. It's the only force pointing in or pointing out of the circle. Tension equals mv squared over r, and I'm solving for tension here. That's how much force must be provided uh, by the string, whatever the tension has to be. Now, examining this, I know the mass, great. I know the radius, great. I'm looking for tension. The one thing I don't know is the velocity, but I do have enough information to get the velocity. Notice I have the ball makes a rotation every 0.5 seconds. That would be the period, if you will, capital T, not to be confused, by the way, this capital T for period, not to be confused with this capital T for tension there. So make sure to keep those straight. Um, and I also have the radius. To calculate the velocity at any point in time, velocity equals 2 pi r divided by the period. Maybe I'll actually write in period there. We use capital T often for period, but not to confuse it this time. And I come out with this thing going at a tangent of velocity by doing the circumference divided by how long it takes to go around, so how far it is around divided by how long it takes to go around. It's velocity, displacement divided by time. Um, so I come out with a velocity of 7.037 meters per second, which then can get substituted into my equation. I'm trying to solve for the tension in the string here. And given my two sig figs that I'm allowed through this problem, uh, I have a final answer of 30 newtons here is how much tension uh, the string must supply uh, to, not, uh, to cause this object to be able to cause the ball to be able to go in a circle. Now sometimes you'll see instead of actually solving for the velocity and substituting in, sometimes what you'll see happen is actually just taking this equation, 2 pi r over the period, and plugging that in for the velocity inside the equation and working it out all in letters instead of in numbers. So don't be surprised if you see that going forward in the future.